Welcome to Christmas in VDR. My name is Timothy Lattice and this is the Neo Kino Graphics Channel. This is going to be a more detailed look at some of the topics in prior talks. First, thanks to Filippo for an interesting tech discussion. We're going to begin with looking at why SDR 8 bit per channel can be better. Talking about my usage case here, the Steam Deck and Steam Machine. Let's look at the ALU required just for the color transform. This will be effectively the number of gigaflops you have to burn for a linear to output space transform. The local screen on the Steam Deck is 800p at 90Hz on, for the OLED version, which is a nice 92 megapixels per second, which is very reasonable. However, a lot of times you'll be running an external screen, or at least I am, and for most people, the typical external screen is going to be 4K at 60 minimum. So we'll be looking at that half a gigapixel per second on the Steam Deck at its one teraflop FP32. If we do the gamma conversion, it's going to take 1.3% of 1 teraflop. And if we look at the PQ version, it's going to take 3.7% of 1 teraflop. Given that most of the time we're dealing with a death by a thousand cuts, every time you can cut the cost of something by half, you often have to do it. I'd rather have the savings of running in the gamma mode. Also, 10-bit per channel HDR is not free. For instance, on the Steam Machine. For instance, I covered this on my Steam Machine talk. If you run in 10-bit, it's going to cut FPS or it's going to require signal decimation. For HDMI, it's going to require chroma decimation. And for DisplayPort, it will require turning DSC on, neither of which I want to do. Next, let's dive into understanding dynamic range a little bit better. There are effectively two sides to dynamic range. We have what is visible as improvements to black level. I would call this contrast feel. And then on the other side, we have what is visible as improvements to peak white levels. I would call that HDR feel. The distribution of these depends on scene exposure, or APL. This is where you can set exposure depending on your viewing environment. You note for games, instead of having a brightness knob, it really should be an exposure knob. So the APL, or the scene exposure, set by the room background and ambient level, that is represented by the purple line. On the right of that, we have the yellow line. As APL rises, the cheating peak brightness tapers off of HDR displays. And then on the left side, the dark side, we have the orange line, and this would be improvement to black levels. When we are able to decrease exposure, those are environments that have less room reflection, and thus true black level also drops. The majority of real gains in OLED showed up here in lower panel reflection and no backlight. Now we're going to be taking APL versus a modern WOLED. We'll be working with this photo from Cade's Cove in the Great Smoky Mountains. This was exposed and developed as is typical in the CRT era. It's a relatively low contrast photo taken in the morning before the sun cuts in. The important thing here is that games should have a user exposure knob. In this case, the image has a border and that border represents room ambient level. The user would set exposure based on what makes sense for the room ambient. If the room ambient goes down, i.e. a darker room, APL goes down. As the APL drops, you'll notice that the scene ratio to that peak white dot in the middle, i.e. the dynamic range, also increases. So in the left, we have a bright room. And then on the right, the room's ambient level is down five stops. And thus we can adjust for that, and we have higher effective dynamic range. Comparing APL to a real display, in this case, we're working with a high-end 2025W OLED as reviewed by TFT Central. First, we're going to need to figure out what this photo's APL is. So I take the photo into an editor, convert it into a linear space, convert it into grayscale, downsample it, run a huge Gaussian blur, convert it back to sRGB, export, and then sample the value, and then convert that value back into linear. Pretty convoluted process, but at the end, we have an sRGB level of 162. Converting that into linear is 0 0.36, which is 36% APL. Now let's look at where the display would be at 36% APL. Now we have a nice thing from TFT Central. They have a graph of window area or APL versus a bunch of panels. These are WOLED panels of various generations. And you'll notice there's a common trend here. Over time, there's been a small increase in the brightness at 100% APL. And you'll look as things go down to zero or say 1% APL, there has been an increase in peak brightness. This I would call the marketing scam area because you only really get a great increase of peak at tiny, very tiny APLs. So in this case, we're looking at 36% APL, and across these panels, we'd be somewhere between 300 to 400 nits. Note that the panel we're looking at does 380 nits at uniform brightness mode. And thus, 
maybe 300 nits in its uniform brightness mode versus say closer to 400 in the HDR mode. And under that context, the HDR mode is effectively having no perceptual impact on the brightness. In order to get some increased dynamic range, we need to drop this photo down effectively five stops of exposure. If we take 36% APL and we divide it by 32, aka five stops, we get to that 1% APL area that has an 1800 nits peak. So we have the picture on the left, the white border represents 400 nits. And then on the right, we have the APL necessary to produce a few pixels of 1800 nits, i.e. those few pixels would be about two stops over the white border. This gives you an idea of just how low your APL has to be to actually get the high dynamic range. Now, another thing to consider is if you're already in a very dark room, and you drop down the APL. In this case, we're dropping it down seven stops, and that way we can show, and that way we can show plus or minus two stops of the peak. So the border in this case is the white at the original exposure, but dropped down seven stops with the image. And you'll notice on the left, we have minus two stops between the white dot and the background. And then on the right, we have the full dynamic range between the white dot and the background. In terms of visual language, when you reach this ultra low average picture level, peak contrast changes are not super transformative. It definitely provides a benefit, that is undeniable, but the benefit is not super important in comparison, in comparison to the other properties I would like to get, such as stable behavior. So one thing we could say about this is displays have very little gains on stable peak brightness. The marketing peak nits climbs only at very tiny APLs. APLs that are unacceptable, really, except for in dark rooms. By the time one builds the associated dark room, i.e. a theater viewing environment, you might as well just drop the APL two more stops and use the stable brightness mode. Note that the majority of benefit is really coming from the dark room and the APL drop and not the HDR standard itself. Another thing which we should address is the absolute nits myth. The first one is the idea that HDR PQ absolute nits signals are accurately represented by consumer displays. This is completely wrong. We'll see some examples next. Also, this notion that absolute nit signals are perceptually the same for different viewers in different environments on calibrated displays. This is also wrong. Classic example below of how human perception is locally relative. And therefore, if you send out an absolute nit signal, people are gonna see it differently in different environments. Let's look at accuracy now. In this case, the same display in sRGB emulation and we're gonna look and see what TFT Central had measured for the variation across its tonal curve. They reported it as effective gamma point at various parts in the curve, and you'll notice that the stock display gamma varies by under two to above 2.2 across the tonal curve. If we look on the left here, we're showing a, a negative 0.2 gamma change. The negative 0.2 gamma change is actually transformative in some respects, so yeah, there's a lot of error on this display. And note the HDR modes have very similar problems, just like the SDR modes. For example, if we look at max bright HDR, you get a very big difference between average picture levels, and you see a lot of tonal changing going on here in gaming mode, for instance. If we look at the TFT central results, testing at just 10% APL across modes, you'll notice the modes also have a lot of variation. This dispels the myth that an HDR absolute nit signal actually displays the nits you asked for in the signal there is still a toddler in the display playing with the values, even on these highest end OLEDs that don't have LCD dimming zones. And also clearly consumers not explicitly setting the right mode, they're gonna get progressively worse accuracy. Even if you use the in signal overrides, you're still gonna have problems on these displays. Absolute nit signals have another core problem. There's a fight between what the content author, the developer wants and what the display wants, the toddler, or what the display needs to do for W OLEDs. The dev would need to model what the display does to know what the display relative signal the human observer will get. This is actually a really hard problem to solve. First problem with the toddler and the OLED is that it's going to be doing global dimming. As it does global dimming, it's effectively shifting display behavior. Also, you'll notice that in game, user calibration is not sampling the white cut across different APLs. And that would be the minimum needed, say, for QD OLEDs to understand display behavior. The more consumer popular W OLEDs, they have even more challenges. W OLEDs have a gamut reduction problem. Due to the WRGB pixels, the two stops of peak typically comes from the W subpixel element entirely. The RGB ratios alone 
have a separate issue. And that is they typically have higher levels out of R and B compared to G. And this is probably because the W is taking up a lot of the slack from the G. So TFT Central found something very interesting in exploring OLED brightness article that they didn't really dive into. And that was that if you look at standard luminance and you compare a QD OLED with a W OLED and then you normalize them, you'll notice that the W OLED has problems in the yellows and problems in the magentas, for instance, and a little bit of problems in the cyan. This is because the RGB ratios are not designed to produce white, and therefore it can't get the full saturation on secondaries right. If you combine these two problems, it makes it extremely hard to reason about the final color output in HDR given the absolute RGB signal values. Another question you might ask is, is W OLED a historical stain? December 2025, TFT Central talks about LG's future RGB stripe OLEDs. So an open question, is LG getting rid of the W subpixel for PC? What about TVs? At least for PC, this could be fantastic as QD OLEDs have poor subpixel layout. It's a pretty sorry state for the huge QD OLED spyware TVs. Notice a lot of these are targeting 120 Hz. That's okay. 120 Hz, we can still do a 60 Hz render and use two frame BFI. It'd be far better if they all supported 144 because then you get a 72 Hz render with two frame BFI. The later Samsung one, the one that hits 165, doesn't have the signal bandwidth to actually support that without compression, so that's pretty much fail. And early models, they don't have very good peak stable brightness, but over time they actually did converge to quite bright. So the latest Samsung has a 376 nits in SDR mode at 100% APL, which is fantastic. So I don't want to let global dimming on for various reasons, and it's important to dive into why. At a minimum, it'd be nice not to have the buffering, the one frame of latency required for frame analysis just to get the APL, assuming that monitors do this, which they would have to if they want consistent APL across the screen. Another problem is that global dimming would, would break working around black crush, unless you model the actual global dimming, because global dimming would change the first visible black level in the image. Another big problem with global dimming is it's not compatible with shader BFI for motion clarity increase. I did a completely separate talk on shader BFI, but the general idea is that you can take, say, a three-frame period and you can push all the energy up on the first frame as much as possible. What that does is that strobes the first frame and leaves the other frames potentially mostly dark. Side effect of this, of course, is that the first frame is going to have a very high average picture level. The next two frames are extremely low, and if the brightness changes on the display, between all those frames, you will no longer get energy conservation and this will no longer work. So in my mind, the extra clarity you get with the black frame insertion with the energy redistribution is super important. It also enables the game, for instance, to render, say, three times less frame rate if you're, say, at uh, 240 hertz, which is fantastic. And you get the same clarity as you would at 240 hertz. Another issue is that tone mapping hides frame energy in still frames. And this results in a massive energy difference depending on motion, if one is implementing motion blur with HDR. For example, on the left we have a very, very bright sphere, and then on the right we have a very, very bright sphere moving. And therefore, if we're going to have these scenes with extremely high dynamic range and very, very bright small areas, we're going to have massive adjustments in APL across the frames, and if global dimming is on, then we're going to have massive adjustments in the exposure of the frames. And therefore, you're going to see something where if you do a fast camera motion, all of a sudden the background starts getting dark. So of course, uniform brightness SDR mode or SDR mode with uh, automatic brightness limiter or ABL turned off, that is the workaround. Another thing we should discuss is really low APLs, and that dithering actually matters a lot. At a minimum, we'd want a user calibration step to figure out the just visible signal value above black, and then inside the program, we would dither this last level. So here's an example. On the left-hand side, I have the reference image from before stopped down, but then I have it done at one bits per pixel. One bit per pixel, if you arbitrarily threshold it, you're not going to conserve energy down there. You're also going to squash all the detail in the band. On the right hand side, I just used a simple air diffusion dither, and you'll notice that it maintains more of the perceptual energy of the scene as well as the detail. Of course, when you use a spatial temporal dither, 
you won't see the individual dots. They'll da be dancing around and thus this thing will look quite a bit better in actual video. And note the same behavior would apply to darks at really low APL. Now note there's a problem that most people do dither wrong. If you dither in the nonlinear output space, that is definitely not going to be energy conserving. It will regrade the output. If we want to do energy conserving dithering, here's an example of how you can do it. And before we dive into this, I should note that you can build a lookup table to factor out a lot of the logic, so this is not quite as expensive as it seems. So if we have a target color orange, which is C, we first compute the nearest visible output values in the perceptual space. And that will be A for less than or equal C, and B, so A will be darker than B in this case. We choose the linear space ratio of A and B required to get C. In other words, we take a, B, and C, convert them back to linear, and then figure out what the ratio of A and B are to get C. And then if you're driving by a film grain that is a uniform distribution from 0 to 1, we'll call that film grain U. If U, which is the uniform distribution, is less than or equal to R, which is the linear space ratio, we output A, otherwise we output B. Note, this is energy conserving, but the output transitions are going to be flat, where C equals A or C equals B and they will transition into grainy C midway between A and B. So if we want to do this user calibration, we need to calibrate against the black crush that typical OLED panels have due to the pixel volatility close to black. One way to do this is to have a moving image of a giant one bit pattern of black and of the next level N, where N is on a slider that the user uses to find the just visible difference between black and the next tone effectively have the user figure out which output step is the first to not get crushed to zero. This would set where one needs to do the dither. Also another useful calibration tool, we could calibrate the tonal curve or at least visually validate it. And this would work in SDR modes. I'm gonna describe the SDR mode one below, but you can also do something similar in the HDR modes. And you could even set it up like uh, Norman Corin does here, and he has three different levels. He has a dark, a medium, and a bright level where you're looking at the difference between a regular gradient and a gradient created using a pixel energy redistribution trick. When the, those look similar at a distance, that is your display gamma. Another question is how would we figure out the stable HDR peak from the user side? One way we might be able to do this is flicker between even and odd frames, each showing half of an SDR image. Even frames would have an adjustable ABL where we would add ABL by adjusting the amount of an HDR white block on the screen. And then the odd frame would have a fixed APL, so no extra HDR white in there. And therefore the two frames would be vibrating between two different APLs and the user would slide the APL until the halves look like they meet tonally. Once the right and the left half meet and you don't see a seam between them, that would be where the display is not doing the global dimming. So that's it for this time. Merry Christmas or Merry Winter Holiday. Holidays can be a magical time. Cheers to you and your family wherever you are. Find the inspiration for an awesome 2026. Take care.